Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. What would you like to know about male health concerns like incontinence, prostate and kidney issues, and bladder disease? I'm Dr. Ray Christensen from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth. And I'm your host for tonight's program on men's health and kidney stones and other bladder and men's issues. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Just give us a call locally at 218-788-2844 or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists this evening, Dr. Rebecca Beach, a urologist from St. Luke's Urology Associates in Duluth, Dr. Steve Teacup, a family physician with the Gateway Family Health Clinic in Moose Lake, and Dr. Paul Tonkin, a urologist with Essentia Health Duluth Clinic. Our medical students answering the phones tonight are all from Minnesota. Michael Borner for, hails from New Prague, Minnesota. Chris Hughes is from Aiken, and Luke Logering is from Crookston. And now on to tonight's program. Dr. Beach, welcome to Duluth. Thank you. You've been here a short time now. It's nice to have you on the program with us. I like to have people introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their training and background and the things that you're interested. Could you do that for us? Absolutely. I grew up in West Central Minnesota. I went to North Dakota State University for my undergrad and uh, went to University of Minnesota Duluth here for medical school. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, and then I did my training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so we're just new back to Duluth right now. Special things that I'm interested in, I did a lot of training in minimally invasive and robotic surgery. And I'm definitely interested in incorporating that in my practice. Great. Steve? Yeah, I um, trained at UMD undergrad. Then I went to University of Wisconsin in Madison for medical school. And then did my uh, residency in family medicine here in Duluth. Um, and since that time, I've been in Moose Lake uh, at the family practice center, or the clinic there, and at Mercy Hospital in Moose Lake for 22 years already. Half as long as I've been there. So yeah. <laughs> great. My, in my interests are mostly, um, I, do, I do emergency medicine, I do um, OB, um, some surgical procedures, C-sections, that kind of thing. Um, Pretty much full scope family medicine. I try to, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tonkin? Well, I grew up in uh, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, but consider myself a uh, fourth generation Duluthian. Uh, my grandfather and his brother had a small grocery store in Lakeside. Uh, I went to college uh, in Northfield, Minnesota at Carleton College and then came here to Duluth for med school. I actually worked with Dr. Teacup and his partners in Moose Lake for a summer. Did a few C-sections with you back then and I had a great experience down there. Uh, and I did my general surgery training and my uh, urologic surgery training in Milwaukee at the uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. And I've been at Ascension now for six years um, and uh, I have similar clinical interests. Uh, do a lot of men's health, a lot of enlarged prostate work, kidney stone work. Uh, surgical erectile dysfunction, and, uh, and then also a lot of robotic surgery there. Very good. Thank you so much. Dr. Teacup, as a family physician, you're out there on the front line. What's the most common urologic, male urologic problem that comes into your practice? Well, I think by far that would be um, signs and symptoms of our complaints of uh, enlarged prostate or benign prostatic hypertrophy. Lots of urinary frequency as men get older. Um, they have trouble emptying their bladders, and so they complain a lot of that type of, uh, that's their major complaint, getting up several times at night, interrupting their sleep. Um, and then there, there's a lot of people that come in that are concerned about prost prostate cancer. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of controversy in how to screen and what to do with prostate cancer, and of course that enters into their questions uh, in the office too. So Dr. Beach, we have an enlarged prostate. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the prostate and the problems it causes and why? Sure. The prostate is a, a gland that sits at the base of the bladder um, and the urethra empties or goes through the middle of the prostate. And as men age, the prostate enlarges and it can cause obstruction, as you would imagine, to this tube that you urinate through. So um, as men get older, their bladders don't squeeze as well as they used to, their prostate gets larger and they can have more, um, they empty their bladder less, um, as not as good as they used to. And that oftentimes will hold on to a little bit of urine, have to go to the bathroom more frequently and get up at night because of those reasons. So beyond the history, what other things do you do to diagnose it? 
So I do a good history and physical. I oftentimes will get a urinalysis just to make sure they don't have an infection or, evid or evidence of other things mm -hmm. going on. I'll do a, typically I'll do a prostate e exam um, and just gauge the size of their prostate. Though men, even with small prostates, can have signs of um, obstructive urinary symptoms. It doesn't necessarily mean just because you have a large prostate that you're going to have obstructive symptoms, or does it mean if you have a small prostate that you might not also have um, symptoms of an enlarged prostate or obstructive sy symptoms? Dr. Tonkin, about what age does this all begin? Well, it can vary quite a bit. I think that's an excellent summary. Um, you know, we, we would often say, you know, between 40 and 50 percent of 40 or 50 year olds ha start to have some sort of lower urinary tract symptom, which, you know, we often kind of quickly blame on the prostate. Um, you know, as I've kind of grown in my own practice, I've, I've come to really realize and, and better understand that a fair amount of men can actually just have an isolated bladder problem. So, you know, you can have a primary bladder problem, meaning it's just the bladder, or you can have a secondary bladder problem, meaning that you have a bladder problem secondary to an enlarging prostate. And so it does get more common uh, with age. Um, and, and certainly for us as urologists, it's a great opportunity. Men will enter the system oftentimes for the first time uh, due to a urinary complaint. And it gives us a nice chance to talk about other kind of men's health issues. Well, Go ahead, great. Steve. One thing I was going to add to that was, um, as I'm drinking coffee, is that you know on a primary care level too, a lot of people don't associate this urinary frequency and urgency with caffeine, and we really should be. Um, it's amazing how much coffee and caffeine that, that we all consume, and at all hours and days of the night. And uh, sometimes it's eliminating the simple things that can make a big difference for people. Dark chocolate too? That's correct. Oh, bad. Yep. <laughs> chocolate has a lot of caffeine in it. Well, Rebecca had said, you know, the idea of taking a good history and physical, and that's exactly right. You know, one of the things that our, our national organization is trying to do is engage us to talk to our patients more and use something as simple as a bladder diary, which is really just a journal of how much you drink, how much you urinate, because it's amazing how many people, the reason they urinate so much is because they're drinking too much. Right. And they don't need medicines, they don't need a surgery, they just need some simple counseling, which is so easy to do. So Steve, are there, as a family doc, are there, and for all, all three of you, are there any preventive things that a, a man can do to keep this from happening? Um, that's a, a really good question. I think the, the main points we talked about uh, so far are just making sure you have a healthy lifestyle. I think stress and stress often leads to people abusing things like caffeine and cigarettes and um, those nicotine and it can be very irritating to the bladder and to the, and to the sphincter and can cause spasm and um, it just taking care of yourself makes a big difference. Keeping your weight down will help a lot. And spending that 45 to 60 uh, minutes on most days with an aerobic exercise clears the, clears the head and uh, keeps your body in shape, keeps your weight down. And then these other problems don't tend to occur as quickly. But as we get older, they, they often will eventually catch up with us to some degree. So is there any truth in the old adage that truck drivers have more trouble and people who ride a lot have more trouble? With the prostate? Well, I would say a patient, or patients that come to me and say that they've always held their bladder, um, nurses, hairdressers, truck drivers that go a long time without emptying their bladder can sometimes present with uh, bladder symptoms, but they're not emptying their bladder well. They've trained their bladder to be so, or to be able to get, hold so much urine that eventually they just don't have a good squeeze to their bladder anymore. So we do see that not infrequently. One of the things we always talk about is you know, the bladder really has two jobs, you know, to hold urine and store urine and to empty urine. And, you know, the classic nurse or teacher who, who can't urinate as frequently as they should, they end up holding urine great, but they then sacrifice the emptying function. And so trying to find that balance uh, is really key. What the other two docs just mentioned too is that the bladder has a, has a way to be trained. And that if, if say, people uh, are in a situation where they do urinate every 30 minutes, they train the bladder to do that. And so the bladder will enlarge to a certain level and then it will, they'll feel like they have to go. You can also train the bladder to go for longer periods of time also, to some degree. And so that's an important thing for people to know because um, a lot of times it's a matter of trying to, like we were mentioning, holding too long is, is not good, but also going too frequently. Sometimes it can, you can help by um, increasing the frequency between urinations and see if you can retrain your bladder to go a little longer. Um, regular prostate exams, 
this gentleman's calling in and asking uh, Rebecca about regular prostate exams, and they've always been okay, but he's having difficulty with urination. Should he be worried? I don't think he necessarily needs to be worried, but he should probably be evaluated and just make sure he's emptying his bladder appropriately. There's nothing else going on, especially these, uh, you know, bladder symptoms can present with, um, or can present with multiple different pathologies. So just always having, if you have any complaint, you should always be, or it's never a bad idea to be checked out by your physician and make sure there's nothing else going on. Does a gentleman usually know when he's emptying his bladder correctly or do you have uh, to study that? Not always. Some people say, come in and they say, you know, sure, I empty my bladder completely every time, but then we d either put in a catheter or a bladder or use a little ultrasound to check how, much, how well they're actually emptying their bladder after they've gone to the bathroom. And it's surprising to them oftentimes how much they're actually holding on. And it, that number often increases as we get older. And there's a certain amount that we're okay with letting sit in your bladder, but if it gets to a certain level, we want to make sure we empty your bladder pretty regularly. So Paul, when do you decide to do surgery? Let's, let's talk about probably the uh, cleaning out the prostate, the sure. TUR, whatever your language is. It used right. to be a TUR, yeah. now it's TERP, and the, right. I don't know what it is today. Yeah, there, there's four or five different, different options that, that we use to, to treat men who have an enlarged prostate. And, and usually, uh, in our practice at least, it's when men have been tried on, the simple behavioral changes hasn't worked, they've been tried on one or two medications, hasn't worked, and they continue to have substantial uh, bladder and prostate symptoms that are really impacting quality of life, sometimes health. Um, you know, some, some men, if they have a severe prostate problem, can go into kidney failure. Um, some men will get recurrent bladder infections or bladder stones. So those, those are all, you know, very significant things. So when those things happen, that's when I start telling people, maybe we should think about this. Certainly men who can't empty their bladder at all and are on a catheter 24-7, those men are particularly motivated to get something done. And really it, it ends up being an urgent sort of surgical intervention for those guys because they don't want to live with a catheter. So does this surgery, for those of you that do it, uh, does that lead to impotence? No, the, 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 the treatments for enlarged prostate have a very, very low likelihood to result in impotence or, or the loss of penile erection. Uh, and similarly, very low risk of incontinence. We're talking about a 1% risk or less. And that's a, that's a very important distinction when you look at uh, procedures for enlarged prostate versus prostate cancer. You know, surgical treatment for prostate cancer, the whole prostate comes out and the risk of impotence and incontinence is much higher. For benign prostate hypertrophy, risks are very, very low. Those procedures are very, very safe and very effective. So it is a very effective, that's it one is. of the questions, is it a, an effective procedure? So then we bring in the, the prostatitis question a little bit. Steve, I'm sure you've seen a few of those. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, prostatitis, uh, you know, inflammation or swelling, infection of the prostate, um, Generally, I kind of think of it as uh, before, before age 40 and then after age 40 as to the causes. Um, there can be causes in, in younger men below age 40 um, that can be related to sexually transmitted diseases. And then after age 40, you start to see more of a, more of a, uh, a bacterial infection, often from uh, prostate that, uh, or bladder that isn't functioning properly that can cause problems with infection. And so then I'm going to turn around and kind of put you on the spot yeah. a little bit. PSA. Right. So we should talk about PSA, and we might have different opinions, and we may not. As a family physician, what are your thoughts about the PSA? Well, my first thoughts are I have a urologist on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> um, second of all, I think it's complex. You know, uh, I think all of us have done lots of research on this, and um, we don't want to do any harm. That's always the question. But then again, we also, I mean, there's even recommendations now that, that recommend against doing routine rectal exams and prostate exams, which personally I, I understand where they're coming from, but I still feel the exam is part of the, is what we were trained to do and I still will do it. And so different doctors feel differently about that. But what I'm getting at is, do we check a PSA? Well, that's a great question. I, I still do, I follow the American Cancer Society's recommendations pretty carefully and I always kind of have. And um, as the, as we're getting better at determining which percentage of the prostate cancers are going to be aggressive and will actually intervene and cause p problems for patients, um, you know, we're going to be able to tell if it's going to be a smarter idea to check them and when to check them, how often, and when not to check them. I, I think it's important for people to know that we don't want to be checking PSA levels on patients that have a lot of other problems that, you know, 10 years or less of life is anticipated. I think you just cause so many more problems by doing that. But as a general rule, I, uh, 
I kind of use that as a guideline. As a family doc, we're on the same page. So we got Tonkin between us. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think Steve said that very well. I, I think we can't turn a blind eye to prostate cancer. It continues to be the number one, you know, solid cancer diagnosed in men. It continues to kill 40,000 men per year. I think most urologists believe that we need to screen for prostate cancer. We're in search for a better test. I think there's a lot of work being done on that. I think ultimately it's gonna probably come down to maybe urinary proteomics or genetic testing will ultimately be the thing that gets us to where we wanna go. But you know, the, the whole landscape of prostate cancer management is totally different now than it was five or 10 years ago. I mean, basically we don't operate anybody with low grade cancer anymore. You know, 25% of my patients I diagnose with low grade disease and, and they never get treatment. How do you diagnose that? Um, it's usually a combination of they come in with a PSA that's high or they have symptoms and I check the <coughs> PSA, an exam that's grossly abnormal, we do a prostate biopsy um, and, we, and we find cancer. Um, we're using more sophisticated tests uh, like MRI guided biopsy and MRIs of the prostate to get ideas of what cancers might be clinically significant and we intervene on them. I mean, the landscape of the, patient, of the cases we actually do now is so different. I don't do any low-grade cancer anymore. All the cancers I do are these life-threatening high-grade cancers that really do need treatment. So Rebecca then, what kind of things that you do to us poor guys cause impotence? The main cause is prostate cancer treatment, whether that be with radiation or with surgery. I think that's still the number one cause of, uh, surgical cause um, for impotence. Thankfully, with new techniques, you know, like you were saying, five, 10 years ago, things were way different and a lot of prostatectomies were done open. It's hard to see the nerves um, when you're doing a prostatectomy that way. With new, the new robotic technique, you know, you can see the nerves quite clearly. It's a lot, so your chance of having erectile dysfunction after the surgery, if you had good erections before the surgery is a lot less. They'll never be as good as you once were, but the chance of you being completely impotent if you weren't impotent before is less. The, also the chance of being completely incontinent is a lot less. And I think that that's a, the big advantage of doing robotic surgery is, or a minimally invasive surgery is the, the, the decrease in um, urinary leakage. Finasteride for BPH, Steve. Yeah. BPH, uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy. Right, and, and I think it's believed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, but they believe that the uh, prostate um, grows with time and age and testosterone. And so finasteride is an anti-testosterone. It's basically boxer receptor, I believe. And so uh, it's a slow drug. It takes a long time, I, I believe months, to actually see the improvement. So you can't expect improvement overnight. It, it's pretty free of most side effects. And in fact, they've marketed some of it. It's also used as a hair loss uh, medication to prevent hair loss in a much lower dose. I think it's a one, one milligram milligram. propatia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so it does work well. I think it's, it's, it's something in your toolbox that you have for patients that, uh, that often will be tried before um, we'll send them on to the urologist to determine if there's other things that can be done. How about, um, how about Cialis for BPH? One of you two sure. have a thought on that one? Yeah, Cialis is a, a kind of a newly, um, or it's kind of new on the market for BPH symptoms. It's the five milligram tab daily. It's kind of a nice bonus for a patient that also has erectile dysfunction um, they, and lower urinary tract symptoms that they can be on one pill to manage both things. Very good. Um, one, one final question, prostatectomy years ago, but increasing urinary frequency, should I be worried? I think that's something that you definitely want to be evaluated by. It could be just, you know, it could just be aging and it could be many other things. But one thing that we worry about is that they could be developing a stricture between the bladder and the urethra, and certainly you want to see your doctor about that. So, Paul, you're the stone man. You brought a bunch of stuff in for us to look at. Right. And I'll <laughs> ask him to put that up for us. Um, and I believe, yeah, there we go. Uh, alongside of Paul's wedding ring, I don't, yeah. I don't know if his wife is well, real happy. <laughs> Emily's going to be thrilled when she sees that. <laughs> I lost that ring for about eight months. I just recently found it. Now it's next to a stone. So, <laughs> so can you tell us what you have here? Yeah, so we're looking at there is really a nice example of what most people call a jack stone, which is a very large uh, stone that's in the bladder. Now, clearly that's the size of a stone that would never pass. And, and that's a stone that I actually removed through an open operation. I actually made a small incision in the abdomen, opened the bladder and pulled that out uh, intact. Um, and then kept it because of its cool design. And, you know, to keep my marriage strong, I, I keep that at the office. That, that one isn't at home, you know. So, uh, and then there's some smaller stones next to it. And th those are stones that, you know, would, would be or could be the size that we see uh, in the kidney. Um, and, and, and I did bring one other thing here, which is called a urethral stent, if I can show this to our viewers. Um, and and this, is, this is a small uh, device that, that really... Hold it still. You can see that there. So there's a curly Q in one end 
Curly Q on the other. And this is a small device that we often put in at the end of a kidney stone procedure where we pass a small telescope in, up into the kidney, use a laser, break a stone up, pull those stone fragments out. We leave this in place uh, to let that kidney drain for a few days while the patient recovers. Um, you know, I've yet to get a thank you note for placing one of these in a patient. And they, you won't. Yeah, and I probably <laughs> won't, right? I'm not gonna hold my breath for that. But, but it is kind of a necessary evil most of the time. Um, and, and, you know, common complaints that patients have would be, you know, uh, irritation of the bladder, urinary frequency. But, you know, one of the things is just an idea of, you know, this, this is about the caliber diameter of a ureter. And so you can get the sense of just how small that is. And then also, um, you know, it's, it would take a very small stone to block that ureter. And that's often what happens. So a lot of our patients are surprised that such a small stone can cause so much pain, but it happens all the time. And what, I, I don't think I caught it if you did say it, what makes these stones form? Well, the most common cause is dehydration. And, and so, you know, we, we service a lot of working class people, people who work for a living, people who like the outdoors, like to mountain bike, like to garden. Uh, people get dehydrated, um, their urine volumes go down, they get urinary crystals in their urine, a small stone turns into a big stone, a big stone will block the urinary tubes, and then you're off to the races in terms of symptoms and pain and needing surgery. I'm gonna run through just a few questions now and. Uh, I'll start with Steve. I, I looked at Rebecca, but I'll do this to Steve. Does an active sex life reduce prostate cancer risk? And you can all weigh in on this one. I would say no. But so, I, I'm not, I would go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so, so there, there is some data out there that, that says that, you know, men who are quote unquote frequent ejaculators, which is kind of an odd term that's in our literature, uh, actually have a, a, a lower risk of, of prostate cancer. But, you know, it's just one of those things I love telling patients about to, you know, Make sure they give me good favorable ratings when they leave. You know, I'll write your prescription for it if you need me to, that sort of joke, you know. Uh, so there is probably some truth to it, but it, it's not, it's not a, re a robust risk reduction. Rebecca, how do you prevent recurrent urinary tract infections? I think the most important thing is just to drink lots of fluids, go to the bathroom every couple of hours during the daytime, keep your, you know, keep your bladder flushed and keep your bladder healthy. Um, and then just really general health is always good. Keeping, taking care of yourself decreases your risk of infections. So whoever wants to weigh in on this one, does a broken tailbone cause testicular pain? So Steve, I'm gonna look at you first because <laughs> maybe we get yep. more involved. Well, um, I'm just thinking and don't throw it back wise. I would say that it, I would say that it, it probably can, but um, usually it's local pain from the coccyx fractures that I've seen. Yeah, it hurts right there. Right. Yes. Yep, and, and you know, people sometimes, everybody's wired a little differently too, so. It kind of depends on what else happened with the injury. From the coccyx fractures I've seen, you know, they say it's one of the most useless x-rays to take, but you're not really looking for that. You're looking for other, right. other things upstream that could have been fractured. Mm, agreed. Paul, what is the cause of a dry orgasm and what can be done for it? Well, most common cause of what we call a retrograde ejaculation are, are a class of drugs called alpha blockers or selec selective alpha blockers. So those are drugs like terazosin, doxazosin, Flomax, Tamsulosin, Uroxitrol. Um, and that has to do with an internal change in the plumbing. Usually if you get off those meds, uh, that, that goes back to normal. Rebecca, how does low testosterone impact urination? Um, it shouldn't impact urination at all. What does, low what does low testosterone impact in any way? Oftentimes when patients come in and they say they have their low testosterone. Low T. Low T. Um, oftentimes they just have low energy. Sometimes they'll have symptoms of depression. Um, sometimes they'll have erectile dysfunction that is associated or may be associated with that as well. I mean, those are the most common symptoms of low T. So the use of testosterone, I don't know, Steve, do you use testosterone in your mm -hmm. patients? Yeah. Um, what kind of benefits have you seen from that? Well, I think it's important, as was pointed out, not as many benefits as people expect. Um, I think that the, I think there's been a real, uh, the press has really gone overboard, I think, in a lot of the testosterone deficiency, and maybe it's not even the press, it could be the pharmaceutical companies. Um, testosterone is, a deficiency has really been covered a lot. And so people come in and the first thing they want in the office every year is a testosterone level. And testosterone levels vary a lot. So even if you find that you have an abnormal or a low testosterone level, you still need to repeat it at another, another date to confirm that it's low because it does vary quite a bit throughout the day. And so I haven't found that there's, uh, like, like was mentioned, decreased energy. Some people notice that. I think it's important though to also know that testosterone has a lot of side effects and that some of them can be kind of dangerous. The, uh, testosterone in, in, 
in higher doses causes things like acne, it can cause uh, your red blood cell count to climb, um, and uh, it also can, it doesn't necessarily cause prostate cancer, but it can accelerate it if it is present. Quick answer from one of you, does Parkinson's cause incontinence? It can, it can cause a neurogenic bladder, overactive bladder can lead to urinary leakage. I would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Rebecca Beach, Dr. Steve Teacup, and Dr. Paul Tonkin, and our medical students for their work, Mike Borner, Chris Hughes, and Luke Logring. Please do join Dr. Alan Johns next week for a program on arthritis, when his panelists will be Dr. Anna Fernandez, Dr. Victoria Heron, and Dr. Veronica Mesqueda. Um, sorry we didn't get to the hematuria question. Thank you all. It was a great panel. We got most of our questions answered.